Good morning. <clears throat> Sorry. I'll try that again. Good morning. Welcome to Trinity Baptist Church. Um, it's lovely to see so many people here, and it's lovely that the snow has finally gone, isn't it? And we can uh, get out and walk without uh, slipping over and everything like that. As we start today, so we, uh, we're going to start today uh, a series uh, looking at Mark's Gospel. And we're going to look at, often when we do series, I just sort of pick highlights out of books and we, um, we sort of skim through uh, books. But this series, we're going to look uh, at the majority of it, not the whole, we're not going to read the whole book uh, together, um, but we're going to read lots of it. We're going to kind of uh, take our time going through Mark's Gospel, and that will take us right up uh, until the summer. Um, and so we're going to start in Mark 1 uh, later on today. <clears throat> but as we come to worship, shall we just uh, start in prayer? So Lord God, as we start this service, we remind ourselves that it's not us who choose Christ, but Christ who chose us. We remember that we're not here because of our own goodness, but because of your grace. That we're not here to enlighten ourselves, but to allow you to enlighten us. And we remember, Lord, that we've not come to be entertained, but that we've come to bring you our worship with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. And Lord, as we do that, may we know your presence here amongst us. Amen. <clears throat> and so our first uh, hymn this morning uh, is Take My Life and Let It Be. Shall we stand together as we sing?
please take a seat. Um, a few notices to give you. Um, first of all, this coming Thursday uh, is the start of our new um, in-person uh, Bible study group. Um, that will meet for the first few times at least, we'll meet here at the church um, and we'll start at one o'clock, so one o'clock to about two o'clock-ish um, on a Thursday. Um, everyone is uh, welcome to come to that uh, if you would like to. We do also have an online uh, Bible study group, so if you can't get to the one uh, on a Thursday afternoon, uh, on alternate weeks, uh, we meet online uh, in an evening, uh, also on a Thursday. And if you'd like to know more details about uh, either of those groups, uh, you can come and see me afterwards. Um, <clears throat> we also have uh, our the Bible reading notes that we get from UCB, uh, Word for Today. The new ones um, are here and they're at the back. Um, so you can take those if you would like. If you, if you already use them, uh, just pick up your copy. If you don't already use them but you would like to, it's just a, a short thing each day, uh, something to read, a passage and something to think about um, each day to help you uh, with your Bible reading. So if you would like to take a copy of that, uh, you can do from the back. Um, we also have uh, one remaining calendar is the last calendar so I'll take bids for it no I won't really if you would like uh, a calendar the first person to ask me uh, don't stampede but if at the end of the service if you haven't got a calendar yet and you would like one uh, come and see me um, I think um, I think that's all the notices that I need to give for now Oh, um, next week, I should say, next week uh, after the service um, will be our church members meeting, um, so please do stay for that uh, if you are able to. Um, <clears throat> okay, so our reading, like I say, we're, we're going to start looking through um, Mark's gospel, um, and so our reading today comes from Mark chapter 1. Um, and I'm going to read verses 14 to 20 of Mark chapter 1 when I get there. Okay. Is it on there? There we are. So now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, uh, who were in their boats, mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. <clears throat> now we're going to think about that passage together more um, as we go on through the service. Um, but it's a story that involves so Simon and Andrew and James and John leaving everything behind and moving, take, following Jesus. They were told they dropped their nets immediately and follow him. And if you saw when you came in, there was a question on the screen. There's always a question uh, on the screen. The question today was... Uh, what would make you want to leave home? Is there anything that would make you leave home? And normally, sometimes I just put the questions there and kind of don't mention them. Sometimes I do mention them and we don't really do much with them. Today, I just want you to think about that question for a moment. Is there anything that would make you just up and leave and want to go? 
Can anyone think of anything that might make you go? Okay, yeah, so being, being afraid would, would make you want to go, yeah? So if you if it was unable to stay. Anything else that might make you want to move? A job, yes, yeah, so or moving for, for work, yeah? I've done that three times in my life. I've left cities and moved to new places purely for work, really, um, because I felt that that was the, the right thing uh, to do. <coughs> For study, yeah, to find, to go for the right place, yeah. For love, see, that was, I thought that might be the first one, really. Yeah, so, might make you, so Joe, I guess, moved because of me. So I've moved for work, Joe's just followed me wherever I've gone. So, must mean that she loves me, I think. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so a love might make us move, mightn't it? It's interesting, the first one that came out that Kat said, which was kind of, I was hoping we might get there. I wasn't expecting it necessarily to be the first one. But I thought hopefully we would get there. Is that often, often we have a choice, don't we? When I've moved, it's been because there's been something better. I've been moving for something better. But often people aren't given that choice to move for something better. Often people are forced to move not because they want to, but because they have to. We, um, we have a couple of people here today who have had to move, not because they necessarily wanted to move, but because they felt that they had to. And I asked Masain just to share something of his experience of what it was to have to move. And so he's written it, and I will read what Masain has wrote, uh, has wrote. I will share with you a summary of my life story in the last two years. In my country, if someone changes his religion, he will be sentenced to death and no Muslim has the right to become a Christian. Their becoming a Christian must be in secret. Worship and prayer are different there, and you cannot worship and pray openly. A number of Christian brothers and I gathered once a week in a house that we called the home church and prayed and worshipped. We had to be very careful so that no one noticed us. We carefully entered the church and prayed in a low voice and performed our program. Despite all the problems and stress we had, we had a very friendly group. And every time we went to the home church, I was more attracted to Christianity and I felt Jesus Christ from the bottom of my heart. Our home church was exposed and government forces were looking for church members. It was no longer a safe place for me. I had to leave the country immediately, and if I was caught by the security forces, I would have been sentenced to death. Those were very difficult days. I didn't know what to do. I just knew that I had to go, but I didn't know where to go. I left the country, and after some time, I entered England. At first, I was imprisoned by the border police because of unauthorized entry. Until then, I didn't have the experience of prison. And it was very difficult for me to spend almost five days in prison. During those days, I only prayed to Jesus Christ. I wanted help. After five days, I was transferred to a city in the south of England. And the next day was Sunday, and I went to church for the first time. I couldn't believe that I could be present in a church and pray and worship loudly with other Christians. It felt good to be able to say publicly that I am a Christian and I felt free and proud. In the church, I cried out the name of Jesus Christ and said, I believe in you. I know that you will help me and give me eternal life because I left my home and family to reach you. 
Sometimes I talk to my mother on a video call and tears come from my eyes because I may not be able to see her and hold her anymore. But I never regret what I did and I am sure that Jesus Christ will help me so that my body and soul can find peace. And he goes on to say, in the end, we must say that I'm very happy to be with you in this church and I feel your loving uh, gaze and I hope that the spirit of Jesus Christ will be in all of us so that we can easily love and forgive. In this country, many of us are fortunate that we will never have to move, that we'll never be forced to leave our home. But around the world, for various reasons, many people are forced to leave their home, their family, everything behind, and to adapt to a new culture, new language, new places. And so now we're going to come before God and we're going to pray. We pray for all those who have to leave home, who've had to leave behind those that they love and all that they know. I'm going to start just with a bit of silence so that you each can offer your own individual prayer and then I will pray for us. So let's come before God in prayer now. Almighty and merciful God, whose son became a refugee and had no place to call his own, look with mercy on those who today are fleeing from danger, who are homeless and hungry. And Lord, we pray for all those who have had to flee their homes, for all who have had to leave family and homes and all that they know behind. Please give us compassion and courage. Help us to be aware of the fears and the anxiety, pain and sorrow, difficulties and uncertainty that all refugees suffer. And to remember that we all belong to the same human family. Lord, you share the journey with migrants and refugees, lightening their footsteps with hope. For you, Lord, are close to the brokenhearted. Would you pour out your spirit upon world leaders? May they see the tragedies of our human family and be moved to respond with wisdom, compassion and courage. Open our hearts and our eyes to the God-given dignity of all your people. And Lord, would you move us to welcome our neighbours and so bear witness to your love. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Shall we continue to pray using the words that Jesus taught his disciples? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
And I should have said, <clears throat> after I'd finished reading Musain's uh, testimony, thank you, Musain, for sharing that with us. Um, and I don't know about everyone else, but I'm really glad that you're part of our church here. Uh, yourself and uh, Hamid and Hussein, uh, who was here before but has, has moved on. Because the more diverse that we are, the more we get to listen to one another, the more that we get to share experiences from different people, the closer we are, I think, to heaven. Because when we get to heaven, when we sit around God's throne, they won't all be white, middle-class English people sat there. There'll be people from all nations, all uh, colours, all creeds. And so, in just one small way, you've helped uh, to move our church forward. Uh, and I'm really grateful for that. So thank you, uh, Ms. Aina. Thank you for writing that down. We're going to sing uh, again now. Um, Another uh, great old hymn, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. And as we sing this, uh, we'll take up our offering. <laughs>
Lord God, we thank you for the many good gifts that you give to us. And we ask that you would accept this offering as a sign of our gratitude to you. And Lord, would you use these gifts as well as those given by other means uh, for your glory both here in Bacup and beyond. Amen. <clears throat> Now, you may not know this, um, but I used to do a beach mission. I don't like to talk about it. Um, and I, I loved the beach mission for, for many different reasons. And one of the things that I loved most about it, especially as I got um, toward the end of my time there, because I, I became the overall leader of it, which meant that I was less hands-on with the kids um, and I was more looking after the team. And... Those, I did that for about six years, I think. And those years, because we were looking after the team, when, when they were off doing, working with the kids, we had a lot of time to sit around and drink tea and eat cake, which was fantastic. And also get into kind of just theological kind of discussions, which I loved. And I've said before, one of the things I loved most about the Beach Mission was that people came from different church backgrounds, had different theological uh, kind of ideas, we didn't all kind of believe every, the same thing about everything, and it was great, and I loved kind of the discussions that we would have um, as a leadership team. And, and one in particular, I remember, is stuck in my mind, because we were sat around drinking tea, eating cake, kind of chatting, um, and my friend Gray just threw a question out. And it's one of those questions that I don't think really has an answer. I, I've, the more I think about it, I don't know what the answer to this is. And he said, what, at what point does the disciple Peter become a Christian? By our understanding of what is a Christian. Is it in today's passage where Jesus says, follow me, and he drops his net and follows Jesus? Is that the moment of conversion, if you like, for Peter? Or is it later on in Mark's Gospel, in Mark chapter 8, which we'll get to in about um, mid-May, um, where Peter says, where Jesus asks the disciples, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah. Is that the point where he recognises who Jesus is? Is that the point where he is saved, he's converted? That is that the moment, I guess, uh, of conversion? Or perhaps it's the point where, when Jesus asks his disciples if they want to leave, and he declares, where else would I go? Because you have the words of eternal life. Is that the moment where Peter's all in? But you see, those are maybe the high points of Peter's journey with Jesus. Because in between, or actually after all of those, I think, we get Peter um, kind of messing up. After these points, it's, he rebukes Jesus. In fact, just immediately after he said, you're the Messiah, and recognizes who he is, he then rebukes Jesus and says, no, you're talking rubbish. You don't have to go and die. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. It's after this that he falls asleep when Jesus asks him to keep watch. And he can't even just do that one simple thing for Jesus. It's after this that he ignores all of Jesus' teachings about turning the other cheek and loving your enemies. And he pulls out a sword and cuts off a soldier's ear. It's after all of this that he denies ever knowing Jesus. Says, nope, never met the guy. Nothing to do with me. Not just once, three times. Is that the act of a Christian? Is that someone who's been saved, been converted? If someone did that, would we say, oh yeah, they're a, they're a Christian? So maybe it's only after Jesus' resurrection where Peter is restored by Jesus 
given a job, go feed my sheep, that we would say that he's fully converted by our standards, by kind of 21st century Western church standards. At what point does Peter become a Christian? At what point would we welcome him into membership, say, yeah, you're fine. We think you're a decent guy. We think you've got it sorted. Like I say, it's it provoked a good discussion amongst us. And it's one of those questions that I don't think really has an answer because I think maybe it's the wrong question that we're asking. Um, <clears throat> because I think today's passage in particular suggests that that, that is the case. I've spoken before um, about bounded sets and centred sets um, and the difference between those. Um, just in case you've forgotten what I've said or if you've never heard me talk about bounded sets and centred sets before. The difference, uh, a bounded set is something you're either in or out. So if we took food as an example of that, you could ask the question, is it a fruit? And there's a very definite, so yes, so a, a, a tomato, would be a yes, that's a fruit, an apple, a banana, all those are yes, they're in a carrot, a cake, no, they're not. So you're either in or out of a bounded set. And Christianity is often thought of as being a bounded set. You're either in or out. But as I've said before, I think the example particularly of Peter um, suggests to us that actually it's more complex than that. And it's better described as a centred set, which is where everything is on the kind of uh, the map, but you're just closer or further away. So a question, again, for a centred set using food would be, is it good for me? And so some things would be better for you than others. So we might say, uh, is is a carrot good for me? Yes, that's because that's kind of close. But is a, you know, is chocolate cake good for me? Well, maybe not, but it, it you know, boosts my uh, my well-being. It makes me happier, so maybe uh, it can be further away, but it's still on the scale of how we define, I guess, good for me. Um, and so. Um, Sorry, I'm distracted because I'm trying to I'm trying to work the computer down there as well as uh, talk to you. I should stop doing that. Um, and so the uh, Christianity is often thought of as being a bounded set. You're either in or out, but actually it's more complex than that. And I think that um, Peter's example in particular shows that it's more of a centered set. That we we are all on a journey to be more like Christ, to be close to him. And Peter's journey with Jesus is one that has ups and downs. It isn't just a straight line. It isn't just I drop my nets, I follow you, and I get closer and closer to you and more Christ-like as I go. There's moments where Peter is all in and absolutely on fire, and then there's moments where he says, no, I don't know who he is, I've never met him before. It's an up and down journey. It's one step forward and two steps back at times. And so if our journey is a bit up and down, if there are days where you go, yeah, I would absolutely drop my net and follow Jesus, I'm all in, and there are other times where you go, I don't know if I could do that. That's okay, I think. Because the important bit is just to be on the journey. Because you see, when we read today's passage, I think it can be inspiring, but it can also be perhaps disheartening. It's inspiring, isn't it, to see Peter, or to Simon as he's known here, and Andrew uh, and James and John willing to drop everything and to follow Jesus. But it's also disheartening when we stop and we think, would I do the same? And perhaps we might come to the conclusion that I don't know if I'd be able to. 
I'd want to at least go back and say bye to my family before I just dropped my nets and followed him. And the problem is, I think, when we read passages like this, we're tempted to make them normative. That is, that we hold them up as examples of what everybody should be like. But this isn't a normative story. This isn't a story that says, this is what followers of Jesus are like. This isn't a story that says, this is what everybody has to do. Jesus doesn't always call us to drop everything and to follow him. He doesn't require that everybody moves to a new place or to a new job. That everybody has to have a dramatic conversion experience. Some of us will get a call like that. I know, uh, I remember David Livermore, um, when he was minister here, speaking about the moment that he decided uh, to jump off a cliff for Jesus, as he put it, where he's decided to to leave behind a very well-paying job and pursue ministry. And as I look back over my life, I had something similar, not when I decided to become a minister, but when I was 18, and I believe that God called me to move away from Bacup and to work for Careforce. Because up until that point, I had no desire at all to leave Bacup. In fact, my preferred, all the way through doing my A-levels, my preferred university was to go to Preston so I could come back at weekends and play for the same football team and hang out with the same friends. I never wanted to leave. And then I had an experience where I believe that God spoke to me and told me that, and it involved moving. But I'm aware that not everybody has that moment. Not everybody has that call. The call that Jesus makes to us is individual. He doesn't say the same things to each person. The writer, uh, Melissa Bain Sevier, writes this. She says, we need to remind ourselves of this obvious fact. Not everyone is called to leave the boats and nets, to leave family and place. The vast majority of us are called to stay where we are and serve God there. You see, the crucial thing in this story is not so much the dropping of the nets and the leaving of the homes and the families and everything else behind, but rather it's just the decision to say yes to journeying with Jesus, wherever that might take them, whatever that might look like. And that same call, that call to journey through life with Jesus, to follow him wherever he might take us, is made to each one of us. That call is made. It might look different for each person, but that call to follow Jesus is made to each of us. And so whilst our decision to say yes might not look as dramatic as that of the first disciples, it's no less crucial. And today's passage also gives us a glimpse of what it is that we are being invited into. Because we're being invited to draw closer to God as he draws close to us. Our passage begins with Jesus uh, starting his ministry with the words, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. I wonder what you think of when you hear the kingdom of God has come near. For me, it always conjures up those people that you see. When I, if you go to kind of big football matches and you often see people stood, like certainly when you've to, been to Wembley a few times, there's always a guy stood on Wembley Way with a sign that says, the end is nigh, you know, repent and believe. That, that's kind of, I always, that's sort of in my head. Kind of Jesus is coming and producing, you know, we've not got much time, repent and believe. That's not what he is saying. Rather, he is saying, literally, the kingdom of God is near, is at hand. Jewish society was built around the temple system. And at the heart of the temple was the Holy of Holies, where the presence of God was believed to dwell. And nobody could get close. One priest 
once a year could go in and they used to tie bells to him and if the bells stopped ringing it meant that God had struck him down and they had to then pull him out with a rope because no one else could go into the holy of holies and be close to God. But here, in the person of Jesus, the presence of God is not hidden away behind a big thick curtain available to one person once a year. The presence of God is here amongst them, is near. And so the disciples are invited not just to learn about God and his kingdom, but to journey with him, to experience what the kingdom looks and feels like in action. And that is the invitation that is made to us. It's an invitation to draw close to God, to follow him, to experience what it is to have the kingdom of God, the presence of God nearby. Someone once uh, wrote, and I, can't, I couldn't find the quote, I can't, rem- I can't quote the person, I can't credit the person, but I remember reading this, that the word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. And we've spent the last 2,000 years trying to reverse that process. Following Jesus is more than just telling people about him. It's about living a life like him. It's about being where Jesus would be, doing the kind of things that he would do, being with the kind of people that he would be with, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God, that the Jesus, that Jesus who calls us and thinks that we're good enough to follow him, thinks that others too are good enough to follow him. And Jesus today wants to transform lives as he did when he walked the earth. That is what we are invited to be a part of. And it might involve dropping our nets and following him. Or it might involve staying where we are and following him. Whatever it looks like. We are called to journey through life with Jesus. So our next hymn speaks of that call that Jesus puts to each and every one of us. Will you come and follow me?
Sorry, if I can invite the deacons up to join me. Uh, It's a custom of our church here at Trinity that when we lose members of our congregation, at the next convenient communion service, we remember their service to the church. And since our last communion, we've lost both Trevor Bartram and Jean Stocks. Now, Trevor played a crucial role in the operation of the church over many years as deacon, church secretary, trust secretary, local preacher, and church treasurer. And Jean, she was a Sunday school teacher for many years and leader of the primary, was the BMS secretary, and a Tuesday club member. So it's fitting that this morning, in our prayers, we remember both Trevor and Jean. So let us pray. Lord God, our loving Heavenly Father, we remember this morning in our thoughts and prayers the lives and commitment of both Trevor and Jean. We thank you for their lives. And we thank you for their commitment to you and their service here in our church family. We thank you for the blessings that they brought to us, for their love and their care and their service. And as we remember them as members of our family here, we also pray for their families at home as they adjust to being without them. Lord, bring them comfort and peace and may they know your continued presence with them. We also pray for ourselves here, as we will miss both of them. Lord, we do thank you and praise you for them. We pray that you'll continue to be with us as we mourn our loss. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Thank you, John. There are no special qualifications needed. No particular connections or exclusive memberships required. No secret passwords or unique attributes expected. No campaigning or canvassing. No examinations or reference checks. There is just an amazing invitation to a feast. In love, God opens wide the doors and welcomes us into his presence. Saints and sinners alike, he spreads a table before us filled with the richest fare, a feast of love and mercy for the body and soul. So come. Come with your doubts, come with your hopes, come with your inadequacies and with your strengths. Come, for this is a table where all are invited and all are welcome. The Apostle Paul tells us of the institution of the Lord's Supper. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, 
saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, just as Jesus prayed uh, before sharing uh, the bread and the wine, we will do so. Help us prepare our hearts as we partake of this bread and wine, which are two beautiful symbols of Christ's body broken for each of us, for each of us here today, and his precious blood shed for us. We praise you and give thanks for this. Father, we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, and yet you stoop down to save wretches like us. So we come now in respect, gratefulness, thankfulness and remembrance of you, your body broken and your blood shed. And it's in and through Jesus' name that we pray this morning. Amen. It was at a table like this that Jesus shared his last meal with his followers. And so we lift the bread as he did and break it as he did. And we share it, remembering his words. My body is broken for you. Eat and remember me.
we also lift the cup as he did. We share it remembering his words. My blood is shed for you. Drink and remember me. And as we get uh, the little cups of juice, we hold on to them uh, to drink together as a sign that uh, together we are one body. Drink this wine with thanks. It is the gift of God to bring us joy. It is Jesus poured out for our redemption. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you have put your life into our hands, and so now we put our lives into yours. Take us, renew us, and remake us. What we have been is past, what we shall be through you still awaits us. So lead us on, and take us with you. Amen. Whenever we have a passage about following Jesus, the first song that comes to mind is my favourite hymn because it speaks about, I uh, rose, went forth and followed thee. So just for that one line, if for nothing else, it may not fit the rest of the thing, but just for that one line, we're going to sing, And Can It Be? Shall we stand together and sing?
please do stay and have tea and coffee uh, and refreshments with us uh, after the service. For those who've been watching along at home, uh, I apologise, I think we've had some technical issues, so I think the entire sermon may not have been uh, visible, which might be a blessing, uh, who knows. But I will, uh, I will upload the whole, so we record it, so I will upload the service in its entirety at the end uh, uh, in a few minutes' time. But as we finish, uh, go now and follow where Christ calls you, proclaiming the message that God gives to you. And may the living Lord go with you. May he go behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over you, beneath you to lift you from your sorrows, within you to give you the gifts of faith, hope and love, and always before you to show you the way. Amen.